step out onto the launch pad. The cold night air hits you as you release a nervous exhalation of breath. You glance across the expanse and you're confronted with the realisation of your decision. There's no turning back now. You crane your neck, looking up at an enormous rocket ship, 17 storeys tall, groaning and hissing as you approach. You inhale and gulp. That colossal structure is filled to the brim with supercooled hydrogen oxygen, over 380,000 gallons of the stuff. It's essentially a bomb and you're going to strap yourself to the top and hope for the best. You head to the elevator to ascend the 90 feet to the launch platform, where, should you need to, you can release some of those pre-launch jitters on what is affectionately known as the last toilet on Earth. Finally, you're guided across the orbiter access arm to a small white room where your parachute harness is attached. You turn to a closed circuit camera and wave goodbye to your loved ones. Now, it's time to take your seat. Into the shuttle you go, up a small ladder and onto the flight deck. The ground crew strap you into your seat and don your helmet. And then, you wait. Time ticks down. You're in limbo, even down to the last minutes. It's gonna happen. We're gonna launch. Auxiliary power fires up with seconds to spare. Here we go. 10, nine, eight, seven, six. A guttural rumble of the main engines igniting vibrates through your core. Five, four, three, two, one. Lift off, the solid boosters ignite and you're off. This is it, you're pinned to your seat. The acceleration is immense. You reach hundreds of miles per hour before you even leave the launch tower. You continue accelerating all the way up to 17,500 miles per hour over the next eight and a half minutes. It feels as though a celestial being has reached down from the heavens and is yanking you up through the atmosphere in a manner in which you simply cannot control. None of the training you've completed seems relevant and your existence is simply at the whim of this godly force. It's a long eight and a half minutes. Long enough for you to reminisce about what you're leaving behind and, excuse the pun, the gravity of the situation. Talking of gravity, the final two and a half minutes of acceleration, you experience three Gs of force. It feels like five bags of concrete crushing your chest. You effectively weigh three times what you normally do. And then, as you leave the Earth's atmosphere, you hear a distinct chunk as the fuel tanks detach and suddenly it's dead quiet. You made it. You're in space. As of today, there have been 628 people that have made it into space, according to the FIA definition. That's 0.0000078% of the global population. Put another way, the average person has a 1 in 12.8 million chance of becoming an astronaut over the last 50 years. Admittedly, they're a pretty rare breed. The average applicants have multiple master's degrees, PhDs, and an abundance of flight experience, normally in fighter jets. And even if they manage to enter a space program, they're expected to complete years more training with extreme physical and mental challenges. And that's even before they get to look at a launch pad. Now, I'll admit, it sounds like a dream to go into space and experience things that only a handful of people have managed to experience. However, before you sign up for your third PhD and pay for those flight lessons, there might be a few things you want to consider first. Look, it's becoming evidently clear that we're at the dawn of some new chapters in human civilization. And there's no doubt about that. Paradigm shifts in technology, self-learning AI systems, transhuman modification straight out of a Hollywood sci-fi movie, and of course, the inception of a new space age. But unlike the last space age, which was largely driven by a race for nuclear arms between the USA and the Soviets, this one is likely to spawn new colonies, industries such as mining and tourism, and truly make us a spacefaring civilization. It's about time. The thing is, the human body has evolved over billions of years to exist in one very specific place, the surface of the Earth. And even parts of that are fairly inhospitable. Take a scorching desert near the equator, where temperatures of 45 degrees Celsius and up are routine. Virtually no vegetation, hardly any humidity, let alone fresh water. Or what about a frozen wasteland in one of the polar regions, where temperatures of minus 40 degrees Celsius are common? You'd need to be extremely well prepared, equipped, and let's face it, lucky, to survive in either one of those places for more than a few days. But here's the thing. Compared to the vacuum of space, those places are veritable oasises, Oasis, sissies, yeah, one of those. Either way, they're nice places when compared with space. 
If you were launched into space with the sun ahead of you, the front of you experiencing full solar radiation, that side would be quickly heated to a toasty 120 degrees Celsius. Whereas the back of you, the side not facing the sun, would gradually cool. I know that in Hollywood blockbusters, people tend to freeze in the vacuum of space. Now that's a bit of a misnomer, generated from the fact that space itself is on average minus 270 degrees Celsius or 2.7 Kelvin, which is almost absolute zero. But the thing is, space is hard vacuum. Heat transfers very slowly, like in a, a thermos at home. And because of this, no energy can be transferred through conduction or convection, because there's no matter to transfer the energy to. So your backside would slowly cool by radiating photons. Yeah, that's the sentence I chose. Things wouldn't be much better if you were in the shade. You'd maintain your body temperature for a while, so one less thing. But with a distinct lack of any atmospheric pressure, you'd have to contend with gases expanding and bubbling out of your blood in your circulatory system. You'd probably swell to around twice your normal size. Not the most comfortable way to bulk up. However, with no breathable oxygen, you'd be a goner in a matter of minutes anyway. Let's be honest though, no one's gonna launch themselves out of the atmosphere in nothing more than a Mickey Mouse onesie. You'd at least be in a spacesuit, or even better, a spaceship. The thermal issue is a relatively easy one to resolve. Multiple layers of insulation materials like mylar take care of that, with heaters and cooling systems balancing things out. And a pressurized cabin with a nice supply of oxygen keeps you normally shaped and breathing. What a luxury. So, for the short term, you're pretty much okay. The thing is, a spacefaring civilization would need to be spending more and more time in space, on space stations, hotels, even colonies. A simple trip to Mars would take around seven months with current technology, and that's at an estimated speed of 24,600 miles per hour. Space is big. So, what are the issues that might arise from staying outside of Earth's protective bubble for longer than, say, a few months or so? Well, for that, we can draw from the evidence provided by the budding rocketeers that spent a stint on the International Space Station. One thing that needs to be addressed is the effect of microgravity on the human body. Although it looks pretty cool flying around and eating spheroidal bubbles of food freshly squeezed out of containers, there are some pretty severe consequences that occur when spending long periods in a weightless state. The human body adapts to the stresses that are put upon it and only regenerates tissues that are necessary to mitigate those stresses. So, if your skeleton is no longer under the load of your body weight, genes that promote osteoblasts to produce structural bone aren't activated. Moreover, as time passes, your body repurposes existing bone tissue, demineralizing low-bearing bones as they're not required for structural stability in this novel environment. This effect is one not to be overlooked. It has been shown that astronauts lose one to 2% of bone density every single month in space. So a round trip to Mars with a three month stop off to wait for the planets to realign, assuming no extra bone loss on the red planet, would take 21 months and result in anywhere from 17 to a 34% loss in bone density. Similar effects are seen in muscle tissue with a loss of muscle up to 20% of total muscle mass within just a two week trip. There are ways to try and mitigate this with resistance exercise routines, but without the steady pull of gravity, our bodies seem to be pre-programmed to turn into feeble, gelatinous puddles. I seriously wouldn't want to return to Earth after a long period without gravity. Even with an intense recovery program, it still takes experienced astronauts months to recover. Oh, and as if that wasn't enough, the effects of a weightless environment can also make you go blind, or at least it doesn't do your eyes any favors. Here on Earth, we spend a lot of time upright. And as big brain primates, a lot of blood is needed towards the top of our bodies. I mean, it takes a lot of calories and oxygen to reach level 94 on Candy Crush. Anyway, the point is, our circulatory system is constantly fighting gravity, trying to pump blood up to our cranium, take gravity away, and it still pumps blood up there. So, you know that feeling you get when you stand on your head, blood rushing to your face, making you feel like you're gonna pass out? Well, in space, that's kind of happening all the time, but to a much lesser extent. This increase in intracranial pressure flattens out the eyeball and has been known to cause the optic nerve to swell. Not good. These physiological changes can have a long-term effect on eyesight. So, unless we want to return to Earth partially sighted with the bone density of a geriatric person with osteoporosis and the strength of a small child, we need to solve the gravity issue. Thankfully, this might not be as hard as it sounds. Whilst we can't use some exotic elements stolen from a supermassive black hole to generate gravity, we can simulate an approximation of gravity using centrifugal force. 
Without going into great detail, centrifugal force is an inertial force that results from the angular velocity of an object travelling in a circular path around a fixed point. Like when you spin something heavy at the end of a string. The heavy object wants to fly off, but the string holds it in place. That I want to fly off force is inertial, and with the right size string and velocity, that force would simulate gravity. Spaceships shaped like wagon wheels and cylinders have been theorised in sci-fi movies and as genuine scientific concepts for decades. To be honest, these ideas could take an entire video to explore in themselves. Another way to get around the gravity problem would be to have a ship that simply accelerates for half of the trip at 1G and then decelerates by the same amount for the latter half of the trip. You'd spend half of the trip standing on the one side of the ship and then the other half on what was effectively the ceiling. However, as nice as it might sound, acceleration at 1G for long periods would be very energy consuming and with our current technology this is really not feasible. Nevertheless, with some innovative problem solving and clever engineering, we can certainly get around the gravity issue. Next up, radiation. Here on Earth, most people don't really need to think about radiation too much. Whilst most people are aware that there are risks associated with handling radioactive materials such as radium or uranium, namely the possibility of becoming a Marvel superhero, mostly it's not really in the forefront of our minds and that's because we're pretty well protected from the majority of the nasty stuff from Earth's powerful magnetic field and our atmosphere. If you're ever lucky enough to be near one of the Earth's poles on a dark night, you might be able to see a beautiful aurora in the night sky. This effect occurs when charged particles, protons and electrons, known as solar wind, are travelling near the speed of light and interfere with the Earth's magnetic field. This allows some of the particles to interact with the atoms in our upper atmosphere, ionising them and producing an array of photons across the visible spectrum. Pretty nice. But without the protection of the atmosphere, those particles would make it to the surface and interact with matter, like you. And you see how those atoms were ionised? Those atoms in your cells and your DNA would suffer a similar fate. Not good. There are three main types of radiation of concern. Alpha, beta and gamma. Alpha particles are atomic nuclei such as helium-4, where the electrons have been stripped off in high energy interactions. Alpha particles are highly ionising and energetic, but luckily they don't penetrate matter well. Beta particles are electrons or positrons. They are more penetrative than alpha, but far less damaging to living tissues. They can generally be stopped by a thin layer of aluminium. Gamma radiation is made up of highly energetic photons, the most energetic in the whole electromagnetic spectrum. These massless packets of energy can penetrate deep into tissues and cause ionisation as it passes through. Exposure to gamma radiation greatly increases your potential to develop cancers and it degrades tissues of all types, best avoided if possible. Unless of course you have a propensity towards turning green and becoming very angry. You wouldn't like me when I'm angry. So, what about radiation in space? What do we need to look out for? Well, there are three main sources of radiation of concern in space. Galactic cosmic rays, solar particle events, and radioactive particles that have been captured in the Van Allen belts. Firstly, galactic cosmic rays. Aside from having a really cool name, they do pose a serious health hazard to astronauts. Produced in supernovae, GCRs, as they're more affectionately known, are ionized nuclei of various atomic species, from hydrogen all the way up to uranium. As you might know, supernovae are extremely powerful explosions that occur during the death throes of a massive star. And because of this, GCRs are accelerated to near light speed, which means they can really pack a punch. They are highly ionizing and can pass through the walls of a spacecraft and into human skin with relative ease. Solar activity is another source of radiation within our solar system. Our star has an 11 year cycle, a solar minimum and a solar maximum. Solar radiation is released all of the time, of course. Just lie on a beach anywhere near the equator and the resultant sunburn will show you that. But during a solar maximum, there is an increased risk of activity in the form of solar flares and CMEs, coronal mass ejections. Both of these event types produce potentially lethal radiation. Solar flares flare up quickly, releasing a burst of electromagnetic radiation from innocuous radio waves all the way up to deadly gamma rays, all released with essentially no warning. Travelling at the speed of light, as soon as you see it, the radiation's got you. CMEs, on the other hand, are particles from the sun's atmosphere. It's corona that have essentially been erupted into space. For this reason, they are considerably slower than photons released in solar flares. Travelling at a pedestrian rate of between 250 and 3,000 kilometres per second, slow pokes. This means that we do get some warning, hours, even days, before the wave of charged particles hit us. Very convenient if you're outside of the Earth's protective shields. Astronauts can bunker down in a protected part of the ship during a solar storm. The final type of radiation risk I want to talk about are the Van Allen belts. In 1958, Explorer 1 was launched with an experiment designed to detect cosmic radiation. 
The experiment championed by James Van Allen used a Geiger counter and a tape recorder to detect radiation in a region of space that surrounds the Earth. Final missions, Explorers 2, 3 and 4 and Pioneer 3 mapped out two distinct radiation belts that wrap around the Earth in a donut shape. Particles trapped by the magnetosphere circulate in these regions and aid in the deflection of cosmic radiation that would otherwise hit Earth. Flying through those belts poses a risk, however, not only to the passengers, but also to electrical equipment. For example, flipping bits in your computer system whilst running a telemetry algorithm would be pretty disastrous. Due to the density of particles in the belts, they are best avoided. But based on observations by the Van Allen probes launched in 2012, it appears that the belts are fairly dynamic, growing, shrinking and even separating into three belts depending on interaction with the solar wind. Luckily, there appear to be regions of lower intensity, which biological entities such as you and I might be able to pass through without getting quite so large a dose of the radioactive good stuff. The reality is, beyond low Earth orbit, space radiation gives any potential space traveller a significantly increased risk of radiation sickness, as well as increased lifetime risk for cancer and other degenerative diseases, even damage to the central nervous system. So, how much radiation are we talking? How much more than we experience on Earth? Well, quite a bit more. Astronauts are exposed to ionising radiation with effective doses in the range from 50 to 2,000 millisieverts, depending where you are and the solar activity at the time. For reference, three chest X-rays are equivalent to one millisievert. So astronauts receive the equivalent of 150 to 6,000 chest X-rays. If your future self was, say, mining helium-3 on the lunar surface, you should expect to experience somewhere in the region of 60 millisieverts per hour. That's at least 200 times what you might experience on Earth's surface. So yeah, radiation is significantly higher in the void of space, and therefore a real challenge to our galactic aspirations. Solar energetic particles can, for the most part, be blocked by physical shielding. There has been talk of storing materials, even human waste, in the walls of spacecraft to help block radiation. The issue arises when you consider the galactic cosmic radiation. These particles are travelling so quickly that they can pass through the walls unimpeded or simply ionise whatever atoms the walls are constructed from, allowing subsequent radiation to enter the craft. One way around this could be to create a magnetic shield around the ship that deflects charged particles in much the same way that the Earth's magnetosphere does. There have been some investigations and some hypothesised systems put forward using superconducting electromagnets, such as the EU-funded SR2S project, but technological limitations still exist that prevents this from becoming a reality, just yet. So, with all the high-level training, intensive risks to physical health, and we haven't even touched upon the effects of isolation on mental health, is space travel even worth it? Well, in my opinion, yeah. All of these challenges, although certainly daunting, are not insurmountable. We have thousands of scientists and engineers using sophisticated tools to overcome these issues. I mean, it was only 120 years ago we were barely in the air with a plane made from balsa wood. It's hard to imagine where we'll be in another 120 years. It's what life does, propagates, adapts and evolves, maybe even speciates. It's how life ensures its survival. We must move into the darkness of the cosmos to ensure that intelligent life continues. I'll leave you with some words from the great Carl Sagan. In our obscurity, in all this vastness, there is no hint that help will come from elsewhere to save us from ourselves. It is up to us. If you like this video, please consider liking, subscribing and sharing and commenting. It really helps us to expand the channel and make more and more better content. See ya.